Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The kids aren't here anymore, so I don't get a real salam back anymore. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, al-Rabbil al-Alameen, wa salatu wa salam, wa ala rasulik al-Kareem, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi, wa salam taslima kathira. First and foremost, I don't know about you all, but it feels more like a graduation than it does a fundraiser. I have, alhamdulillah ar-Rahim, enjoyed each and every single moment that I've been here. And subhanAllah, I really want to say that I'm impressed. I'm extremely impressed by Principal Sister Leila. I'm extremely impressed by all of you. Um, all of the performances that you guys put on, and you reek of confidence, and that's what I love. From the very first moment when uh, Sister Hafsa began to MC, and she said she was a student here, I was impressed. Because usually, you know, there's this stigma that Islamic school kids are going to be socially awkward and they're not going to know how to speak in public and they don't have confidence and they don't love their dean and they don't, you know, it's all just being forced on them and they're being holed up into rooms and being forced to rock back and forth memorizing Quran. We don't see that. Alhamdulillah. I want to begin with a little recitation of the Quran. I know that we have had the Quran recited very beautifully. And mashallah, people who spoke much more eloquently than I can speak and spoke in word and poetry, but there's never enough of the Qur'an. And really, as I was sitting there and gathering my remarks and thinking of what I would say today, I remembered these ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْدَعُوهُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ وَجِيمِ إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٍ These ayat are so beautiful and so profound because they call to contemplation and to introspection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the alteration of night and day, there are signs for people of reflection. People who think, people who contemplate, people of pure thoughts, people that are not that whose brains, whose minds are not constantly attacked by useless things, whose hearts are free from empty desires. And those people who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, standing, sitting, and laying down, contemplating upon the heavens and the earth, and saying, Oh Allah, you did not create this for nothing. You did not create all of this in vain. Subhanak, how perfect are you? Taqina adab al we ask your protection from any form of punishment. In essence, there's a sense of urgency that's placed on people of introspection and people of reflection. And subhanAllah, you know, we cannot ignore the incidents that are taking place around the country right now. I just received a very unfortunate text message actually from a sister in another community who was talking about how she was attacked in a store today for wearing her hijab, and yelled at, and cursed at, and said, if you're not going to dress like an American, go back home. And we're engaged in a battle of hearts and minds. Let's face it, we are engaged in a serious battle of hearts and minds right now. But the first hearts and minds that we need to win are the hearts and minds in our own community. And subhanAllah, when I see these types of schools, and the brother mentioned that he didn't have the chance to go to an Islamic school, neither did I. I went to public school too. I've grown up, I'm born and raised in a public school. I have seen what it's like to be in an environment where Islam is not appreciated, to say the least. Where being a Muslim is not something to be proud of. Where being a Muslim is a reason to be ashamed. Where your religion is constantly attacked on an intellectual level, but more so on a cultural level than anything else. And subhanAllah, I've lived that and I've seen it. And when we talk about this battle of hearts and minds, again, it starts with our own hearts and minds. And Imam al Qayyim, he said something very beautiful in that regard. He said that if the hearts are pure, then the minds will also be pure. If the hearts are pure, the minds will also be pure. 
And so it starts off with the purification of the heart. We know that the Prophet said, in the jasadi mulqa, that verily there is a lump of flesh in the body. If it is pure, if it is free of fault, then everything else will be okay. And if there is something wrong with it, if it is defective, then everything else will also be defective. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as Imam was, as the Imam was talking about, Shaykh Islam was talking about, Quran. Don't they think about the Qur'an? Or are their hearts locked? They have hearts that don't think. Because if the heart is corrupt, the thought will also be corrupt. You will not be able to produce true Muslims and true believers of clarity of thought if we don't talk about their hearts. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on the flip side of that, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a group of Muslims in Surah Al-Hujurat that made a faulty judgment and a faulty decision. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the opposite of that, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعَسْيَانِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الرَّاشِدُونَ But Allah made beloved to you iman. Allah made faith beloved to you. And He beautified it in your hearts. And he made you to hate corruption and rebelliousness and all forms of lewdness. And verily, those are the people that are rightly guided. They make the right decisions, they make the right calls in life. And what I'm seeing here, alhamdulillah, is that this school is about building character. And I really see, mashallah, I'm, I'm so impressed. I, can't, I just can't stress that enough, subhanAllah. I'm so impressed. I go to Islamic schools around the country all the time. I do not see students like you. <laughs> Ever, mashallah. I want to round of applause for this takbir for them. Now, dear brothers and sisters, again, it goes back to the battle of our own hearts and minds. And subhanAllah, I don't want to go too long because I know that we are way behind schedule. And I appreciated the appreciation that was shown to the principal as the, as the old Arabic saying goes, Man adamani haqqan kunta lahu abdan, that whoever uh, whoever has taught me one letter, then I am to that person a servant, subhanAllah, and they owe their principle a lot. But really what I want to talk about, and I want to focus on this a lot, what we see that's happening many times with our youth, and what we see what's happening with youth around the country, is that we're not producing thinkers in the Muslim community anymore. We're not producing people of strong character as a whole community now. And subhanAllah, when our youth have that strong connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the hearts are softened, and they're concerned with real things. I mean, I just want you to understand, I just want you to real, recognize what you just witnessed. You witnessed a sister in Austin, Texas, pouring her heart out over Syria. Think about that. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Shaka Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, says in the authentic hadith the Muslim Imam Ahmad, Shaka wa tuhim ina nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi qaswati qalbi. There was a man who complained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that his heart was hard. The Prophet told him, well, you need to accompany an orphan. This isn't about you reading more Qur'an. You don't need to listen to more lectures. Yes, reading the Qur'an softens the heart. Yes, listening to khutbahs and lectures and sermons softens the heart. There's no doubt about it. But you really want to soften your heart? Then accompany an orphan. In essence, acquaint yourself with real issues. Acquaint yourself with true suffering with true causes. And when the heart is pure, the thought will also be pure too. And I want you to think about this. When we sit in our gatherings many times, you know, subhanAllah, Malcolm X, rahimahullah, one of my personal heroes, one of the people who really actually brought me to Islam. I grew up a Muslim, and I spent time away from Islam, and this is what, he was one of the people, subhanAllah, I admired Malcolm X so much that this man who really, who literally, through, through Islam, went from being a prisoner, went from being a nobody, a criminal, to being one of the most influential men in this country. And he said that generations go through phases. And he described this. He was, and I was listening to one of his old sermons. It was an MP3 clip. Obviously, subhanAllah, it's not, it wasn't a video. I was listening to one of his old lectures and one of the things he was saying. And he said that generations go through transitions. First you have a people of action and speech, then you have a people of speech, then you have a people of no action or no speech. I thought to myself, that is exactly in correlation 
When, when Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu said, when Ali anhu became the leader of this ummah, the khalifa of this nation, and he said, you are in need of a people of a'mal, of a people of action, not of a people of aqwal, a people who just talk. Now think about this. Generations transition from this to this to that. In essence, you have people that are passionate about causes, people that strive, that go through hardships, that have to earn, you know, the hard way, that have to really, you know, uh, make a name, for, that have to build their own race, that have to build their presence in countries and, and live as minorities, and live under oppression and break their way out of that. And they are people of speech and people of action, people who lay the foundations of greatness. Then, as it transitions on, you have the kids of those people, and they talk about that greatness. They talk about real issues. Then you have the kids of them and they forget the, they forget everything. They forget what's important. In essence, they become complacent. And I want you guys to listen very closely in particular, especially the youth in here, and the adults also. Something that might be alarming. You know when people are sitting in a room when you go to your gatherings and things of that sort? What are the adults talking about? Possibly talking about politics, right? Uh, sometimes cricket or soccer too, there's no doubt about it. They talk about sports and stuff like that too. But talking about politics, talking about issues around the world, talking about how to solve these types of things. And most of the time when you see their kids, what are their kids talking about? All right? Justin Bieber and LeBron James. <laughs> Period. <laughs> meaningless things sometimes. Absolutely meaningless things. So. I, was, I, I remember growing up, and I was that sportsman, avid sportsman, and we never used to care about Palestine and Palestine. Yeah, I mean, we would do these types of things, and we would say these things, but at the same time, there wasn't a real care here for social justice and, ca and causes and things of that sort. It was just, you know, we would talk about sports, and our parents would talk about what's going on all over the world, and about crises and things of that sort. And subhanAllah, we used to mock the older generation. Then as I grew older, I started to realize at least they were talking about something real. At least they were talking about something meaningful, right? And that's that's the the dilemma that we have some that, that we have in this country right now is that we're, so we're at many po at many points we're not producing thinkers. And alhamdulillah, efforts like this help produce thinkers, people that are acquainted, well acquainted with the struggle of Muslims and non-Muslims, innocent people all over the world, and causes of social justice here and abroad, people that are acquainted, people that have passion, that have purpose. Because I've got news for you. If you are more upset, and this is for adults, youth alike, if you are more upset at the injury of your favorite sports player, or at the divorce of your favorite celebrity, than you are of 300 people that have been massacred in Syria today, then you have an issue in your iman. You have an issue in faith. That's disconnect. We don't want that in our society. We don't want that in our community. We want to produce this. We want people of purpose, people of thought. I don't just want these sisters to become extreme, extremely well, you know, well acquainted, and you know, uh, you know, founders of MSAs and, and, and the most productive members of their MSAs. I want these sisters to go out and to don their hijab and to also be leading efforts of social justice in this country, inshallah, and other student organizations also, to lead by example and to show what Islam has done for them, how it built their character, acquainted them with what is really going on, and made them people of purpose, and made them people of, of, of good causes. Because when the heart is purified, the mind will also be purified. Now, that's the battle of the hearts and minds within. As far as the, the outside is concerned, and this is really what we're struggling with with all the Islamophobia and things of that sort. And you have to recognize, the incident that I just mentioned, mentioned about the bigot, you know, in, in, in another city, or these people like Pamela Geller and things of that sort that are constantly shouting out Islamophobic terms and that are constantly trying to tie terrorism and violence and these types of things to not to tarnish the faith. They are not appealing to people's minds, they're appealing to people's hearts. This is a blind hatred that we have towards Islam now sometimes. Right? This is not an intellectual movement against Islam. The intellectual movement against Islam is in the academic circles and things of that sort. But let's face it, 
I mean, Glenn Beck, Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh, not a single one of them has a college education. That's a fact. They might dominate 42% of public opinion, but they don't even have a college education. They're not scholars of anthropology, they're not scholars of history, they are not scholars of theology, they're idiots. But still, somehow, they dominate public opinion. And somehow, what? this isn't an intellectual battle here. <laughs> but when our youth, young Muslims who are growing up in Islam cannot defend the faith against people like that, we have an issue. And I've seen people, subhanAllah, I remember when I first started off in New Orleans, and subhanAllah, as an imam, someone came to the office and, and you know, this was someone that I've seen, you know, a family who comes to the masjid that's active in the masjid, he was going to med school. He was about to go to med school. And he said, um, I've decided to leave Islam. He said, why? He said, because, you know, I read in this book, and he mentioned a, a book against the Prophet Sallallahu I read in this book that the Prophet did this and that the Prophet did that, and this is immoral, and this is not, you know, this, I, I can't accept this. And I said, all right, well, what's that book? So he pulled out the book and he pulled out the references. I said, we're in the library. Let's pull out the actual books of Sirah, and let's look at the context of all those incidents that you're mentioning. So we pull out book by book by book. And subhanAllah, he's sitting there and his eyes are wide. And he realizes that he's been taken as a fool, subhanAllah. That he's been lied to. That he's been brainwashed. Because he hasn't, given, he hasn't been given a chance to learn his own faith. To learn why his own faith is so special. To learn why his faith is not backwards, but rather this is a faith that gave birth to a civilization that otherwise would not have been a civilization and then turned around to become a civilization that gave birth to most of the world civilizations, including the one we're in right now. <laughs> SubhanAllah, this faith did not make anyone backwards. This faith has not made countries backwards. This faith has, does not make individuals backwards. This is a faith of progress. This is a faith that develops real human beings. People that are dedicated not only to bettering themselves, but bettering everything around them. And we have to win that battle with our own youth. We have to protect their minds. We have to protect their minds. That doesn't mean we isolate them from every intellectual challenge and challenge to us now. No, but at least give them a chance to learn their faith so that whenever they hear these challenges, they can realize how flawed the arguments against Islam are, how flawed these Islamic, Islamophobic attacks are. They can respond confidently and say, you don't know what you're talking about. And this is what it really says. This is what the Qur'an really says. Because let's face it, you're not always going to be able to text message the Imam, although I'm sure he's very accessible. All right? You're not always going to grab someone who knows what he's talking about, and that is a sign of weakness. This is not a battle of hearts and minds. This is not an intellectual argument against Islam. It is, it is vicious, it is savage, and it can be defeated with two things. Number one, with building confident youth who know their faith well, and let, look, I'll, subhanAllah, you know, most of the speakers that you find today have gone through very difficult phases of their lives because they did not have institutions like this, including myself. Have gone through phases of doubts and questioning and things of that sort and had to find it the hard way. We don't want that for our youth. And the other one is the battle of hearts. The battle for hearts. And that, subhanAllah, sometimes we have to recognize that that comes through building these extraordinary characters. That's how they'll win them over. Because that's how the Prophet won so many of his enemies over. There's a story that I mentioned that I always remember in the Sirah. And it's so relevant to this, to this entire cause. The Prophet one day doing tawaf, and there was a man by the name of Fulana. And Fulana was upset because he heard that Islam was coming to change the culture around him. Islam was fighting against his value system. In essence, he fell victim to the Islamophobia of his time, and they're coming to change our ways, and they're coming to take it over, and they're coming to implement the Sharia, ah, and they're coming to do this, and they're coming to do that. So he decided to kill the Messenger So he put a dagger under his garment, he went to the Kaaba, he saw the Prophet making Tawaf, he made Tawaf behind the Prophet after the first round, the Prophet ﷺ turned around completely, looked at him, and he said, Ya Fulana, he smiled at him, and he said, Ya Fulana, be not to hadith what are you talking to yourself about? You're mumbling. What are you talking to yourself about? 
So the Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Akhul Allah, said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm just making the law and remembering Allah. Prophet Sallallahu said, okay, fine. Kept walking around, second round with the law came around. The Prophet Sallallahu turned around completely again and looked at him and said, Fulana, bima tuhadithu nafsik, what are you talking to yourself about? So Ya Rasulullah, Tufa, Azkur Allah, I'm just, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm making the law and remembering Allah. Third time, the Prophet Sallallahu stops him again. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi turns it on and he looks at him and he says, bima tuhadithu nafsik, what are you talking to yourself about? He said, Ya Rasulullah, Atufa, Azkur Allah, I'm making the law and I'm remembering Allah. And he said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam walked up to me and he put his hand on my chest and he started to make dua for me, rubbing his hand, the front, between, alternating between the front and the back of his palm, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said that before he did that, there was no face, no name, no mention that was more hated to me in the world than the name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, after that one act, there was no name, no mention, no face that was more beloved to me than the face, name, and mention of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu knew he was coming to kill him. He didn't fight with him with the same dirty tactics. He didn't attack him first. He didn't pull out a knife and stab him first. The Prophet Sallallahu didn't tell the companions, hey, crowd him, jump him, he's, he's up to no good. The Prophet Sallallahu also did not try to engage in a debate with him because he understood it was something here. You haven't seen the beauty of Islam yet. You haven't seen the beauty of Islam reflected in a Muslim yet. And who could reflect the beauty of Islam more than the one upon whom the Qur'an was revealed? And Aisha radiallahu anha said, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ Quran. He was a walking Qur'an. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's what I want you guys to do. And that's what I want these institutions to produce. People of conscience and people that, you know what, when they get that rude person, that person that looks down upon them, that person that, you know, that person that walks by you and makes a smart comment, that professor that might not be, that, that might be, you know, a little rough with you, that waiter or waitress at the restaurant that's obviously not smiling as much with you as he's smiling or he's smiling with the other customers, that you kill them with love. You show them your character. You show them what your need is about. You're proud of your need. You don't just make it an ego versus ego conflict and say, hey, who do you think you are? <laughs> who do you think you are to look at me that way? You don't do that. <laughs> Respond to evil, repel evil with that which is good, and you will find that the one between you and him, there was enmity. There was enmity, not that they were neutral towards you. Someone hated your guts and considered you an enemy. But because of your character, because of the way you carry yourself, that person turns out to be your close friend and someone who guards you and someone who stands up for you. Someone who says they're not like that. We need to produce those types of people. We need to be those types of people. So that when something like this bombing in Boston, this terrorist attack in Boston takes place, Muslim people, Muslims, will counter that accusation with their character. A person who's a neighbor to a Muslim, a person who goes to school with one of you, a person who knows you somehow, in some way, shape, or form, will say, I know what Muslims are really like. I know who these people really are. And that comes through again, we, that comes through again us building our own characters and purifying our own hearts, purifying our own intellect, thinking about the bigger picture, championing the causes not just of Muslims but of non-Muslims in this country, and becoming what Rasulullah envisioned us to become. Becoming a people of substance, becoming a people of aqwal and a'mal, a people of speech and a people of action. And subhanAllah, I'm impressed. I can't keep saying, I, I can't say that enough. I am completely blown away. I'm so proud of you all, mashallah. You know, sometimes you get pessimistic because you see what's going on in the world and things that sort of thing. And we have to, for, we, we, we cannot forget that alhamdulillah, I mean, we do have young people coming up in this generation that care deeply about their faith, and that care deeply about their about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to them, and that will carry it, inshallah ta'ala, to the next generation and that will be torches, and that will be ambassadors 
for Muslims and for Islam to all of the people around them, Ta'ala. So Alhamdulillah, is, you know, we're still okay. It's not over yet, the world's not over. And we, we have to continue to support and build institutions like this that produce students like this, inshaAllah. And we ask Allah, so I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow each and every single one of you to not only be a good Muslim, not only to be an indiv- not only to be a person who is individually connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but a person who connects others around them to their creator and betters the environment around them. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you all and us all certainty in our faith, firmness in that, and to make us guided and to guide through us and to make us righteous and to write through us. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khairan to all of you. Thank you so much for having me be a part of your function today. I'm blown away. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum.